Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is on chapter 194. Chapter 194. Princess Mary was not in Moscow and out of danger, as Prince Andrew supposed. After the return of Alpatich from Smolensk, the old prince suddenly seemed to awake as from a dream. He ordered the militiamen to be called up from the villages and armed, and wrote a letter to the commander-in-chief informing him that he had resolved to remain at Bald Hills to the last extremity and to defend it, leaving to the commander-in-chief's discretion to take measures, or not, for the defense of Bald Hills, where one of Russia's oldest generals would be captured or killed, and he announced to his household that he would remain at Bald Hills. But while himself remaining, he gave instructions for the departure of the princess and de Salle, with the little prince to Bogachevaru and thence to Moscow. Princess Mary, alarmed by her father's feverish and sleepless activity after his previous apathy, could not bring herself to leave him alone, and for the first time in her life ventured to disobey him. She refused to go away, and her father's fury broke over her in a terrible storm. He repeated every injustice he had ever inflicted on her. Trying to convict her, He told her she had worn him out, had caused his quarrel with his son, had harbored nasty suspicions of him, making it the object of her life to poison his existence, and he drove her from his study, telling her that if she did not go away, it was all the same to him. He declared that he did not wish to remember her existence, and warned her not dare to let him see her again. The fact that he did not, as she had feared, order her to be carried away by force, but only told her not to let him see her, cheered Princess Mary. She knew it was a proof that in the depths of his soul, he was glad she was remaining at home and had not gone away. The morning after little Nicholas had left, the old prince donned his full uniform and prepared to visit the commander-in-chief. His calache was already at the door. Princess Mary saw him walk out of the house in his uniform, wearing all his orders, and go down to the garden to review his armed peasants and domestic serfs. She sat by the window listening to his voice, which reached her from the garden. Suddenly, several men came running up the avenue with frightened faces. Princess Mary ran out to the porch, down the flower-bordered path, and into the avenue. A large crowd of militiamen and domestics were moving toward her, and in their midst several men were supporting by the armpits and dragging along a little old man in a uniform and decorations. She ran up to him, and in the play of the sunlight that fell in the small round spots through the shade of the lime tree avenues, could not be sure what change there was in his face. All she could see was that his former stern and determined expression had altered to one of timidity and submission. On seeing his daughter, he moved his helpless lips and made a harsh sound. It was impossible to make out what he wanted. He was lifted up, carried to his study, and laid on the very couch he had so feared of late. The doctor, who was fetched that very same night, bled him and said that the prince had a seizure paralyzing his right side. It was becoming more and more dangerous to remain at Bald Hills, and next day they moved the prince to Bogachevaro, the doctor accompanying him. By the time they reached Bogachevaro, de Salle and the little prince had already left for Moscow. For three weeks, the old prince lay stricken by paralysis in the new house Prince Andrew had built at Bogachevaro, ever in the same state getting neither better nor worse. He was unconscious and lay like a distorted corpse. He muttered unceasingly, his eyebrows and lips twitching, and it was impossible to tell whether he understood what was going on around him or not. 
One thing was certain, that he was suffering and wished to say something. But what it was, no one could tell. It might be some caprice of a sick and half-crazy man, or it might relate to public affairs, or possibly to family concerns. The doctor said this restlessness did not mean anything and was due to physical causes. But Princess Mary thought he wished to tell her something, and the fact that her presence always increased his restlessness confirmed her opinion. He was evidently suffering both physically and mentally. There was no hope of recovery. It was impossible for him to travel. It would not do to let him die on the road. Would it not be better in the end, if the end did come, the very end, Princess Mary sometimes thought? Night and day, hardly sleeping at all, she watched him, and, terrible to say, often watched him not with hope of finding signs of improvement, but wishing to find symptoms of the approach of the end. Strange as it was to her to acknowledge this feeling in herself, yet there it was, and what seemed still more terrible to her was that since her father's illness began, perhaps even sooner, when she stayed with him expecting something to happen, all the personal desires and hopes that had been forgotten or sleeping within her had awakened. Thoughts that had not entered her mind for years, thoughts of a life free from the fear of her father, and even the possibility of love and a family happiness, floated continually in her imagination like temptations of the devil. Thrust them aside as she would, questions continually recurred to her as to how she would order her life now after that. These were temptations of the devil, and Princess Mary knew it. She knew that the sole weapon against him was prayer, and she tried to pray. She assumed an attitude of prayer, looked at the icons, repeated the words of a prayer, but she could not pray. She felt that a different world had now taken possession of her, the life of a world of strenuous and free activity, quite opposed to the spiritual world, in which until now she had been confined and in which her greatest comfort had been prayer. She could not pray, could not weep, and worldly cares took possession of her. It was becoming dangerous to remain a Bogachevaru. News of the approach of the French came from all sides, and in one village, ten miles from Bogachevaru, a homestead had been looted by French marauders. The doctor insisted on the necessity of moving the prince. The provincial marshal of the nobility sent an official to Princess Mary to persuade her to get away as quickly as possible, and the head of the rural police, having come to Bogachevaro, urged the same thing, saying that the French were only some 25 miles away, that French proclamations were circulating in the villages, and that if the princess did not take her father away before the 15th, he could not answer for the consequences. The princess decided to leave on the 15th. The cares of preparation and giving orders, for which everyone came to her, occupied her all day. She spent the night of the 14th, as usual, without undressing, in the room next to the one where the prince lay. Several times, waking up, she heard his groans and muttering, the creak of his bed, and the steps of Tacone and the doctor when they turned him over. Several times she listened at the door, and it seemed to her that his mutterings were louder than usual, and that they turned him over oftener. She could not sleep, and several times went to the door and listened, wishing to enter, but not deciding to do so. Though he did not speak, Princess Mary saw and knew how unpleasant every sign of anxiety on his account was to him. She had noticed, with what dissatisfaction he turned from the look she sometimes involuntarily fixed upon him. She knew that her going in during the night at an unusual hour would irritate him. But never has she felt so grieved for him, or so much afraid of losing him. She recalled all her life with him, and in every word and act of his, found an expression of love for her. Occasionally, amid these memories, temptations of the devil would surge into her imagination, thoughts of how things would be after his death, and how her new liberated life would be ordered. But she drove these thoughts away with disgust. Toward morning, he became quiet, and she fell asleep. She woke late. That sincerity which often comes with waking showed her clearly what chiefly concerned her about her father's illness. On waking, she listened to what was going on behind the door, and hearing him groan, said to herself with a sigh that things were still the same. But what could have happened? What did I want? I want his death, she cried, with a feeling of loathing for herself. She washed, dressed, said her prayers, 
and went out to the porch. In front of it stood carriages without horses and things that were being packed to the vehicles. It was a warm, gray morning. Princess Mary stopped at the porch, still horrified by her spiritual baseness and trying to arrange her thoughts before going to her father. The doctor came downstairs and went out to her. He's a little better today, said he. I was looking for you. One could make out something of what he is saying. His head is clear. Come in. He is asking for you. Princess Mary's heart beat so violently at this news that she grew pale and leaned against the wall to keep from falling. To see him, talk to him, feel his eyes on her now that her whole soul was overflowing with those dreadful, wicked temptations was a torment of joy and terror. Come, said the doctor. Princess Mary entered her father's room and went up to his bed. He was lying on his back, propped up high, and his small bony hands, with their knotted purple veins, were lying on the quilt. His left eye gazed straight before him, his right eye was gone awry, and his brows and lips motionless. He seemed altogether so thin, small, and pathetic. His face seemed to have shriveled or melted. His features had grown smaller. Princess Mary went up and kissed his hand. His left hand pressed hers so that she understood that he had long been waiting for her to come. He twitched her hand, and his brows and lips quivered angrily. She looked at him in dismay, trying to guess what he wanted of her. When she changed her position so that his left eye could not see her face, he calmed down, not taking his eyes off her for some seconds. Then his lips and tongue moved, sounds came, and he began to speak, gazing timidly and imploringly at her, evidently afraid that she might not understand. Straining all her faculties, Princess Mary looked at him. The comic efforts with which he moved his tongue made her drop her eyes, and with difficulty repressed the sobs that rose to her throat. He said something, repeating the same words several times. She could not understand them, but tried to guess what he was saying, and inquiringly repeated the words he uttered. Mate, eight, eight, he repeated several times. It was quite impossible to understand these sounds. The doctor thought he had guessed them, and inquiringly repeated, Mary, are you afraid? The prince shook his head, again repeated the same sounds. My mind, my mind aches? questioned Princess Mary. He made a mumbling sound in confirmation of this, took her hand, and began pressing it to different parts of his breast, as if trying to find the right place for it. Always thoughts. About you. Thoughts. He then uttered much more clearly than he had done before, now that he was sure of being understood. Princess Mary pressed her head against his hand, trying to hide her sobs and tears. He moved his right hand over her hair. I have been calling for you all night, he brought out. If I had only known, she said through tears, I was afraid to come in. He pressed her hand. Weren't you asleep? No, I did not sleep, said Princess Mary, shaking her head. Unconsciously imitating her father, she now tried to express herself as he did, as much as possible by signs and her tongue, too, seemed to move with difficulty. Dear one, dearest, Princess Mary could not quite make out what he said, but from his look it was clear that he had uttered a tender, caressing word such as he had never used with her before. Why didn't you come in? And I was wishing for his death, thought Princess Mary. He was silent a while. Thank you, dear daughter, for all for all. Forgive. Thank you. Forgive. Thank you. And tears began to flow from his eyes. Call Andrew, he said suddenly, and the childish, timid expression of doubt showed itself on his face as he spoke. He himself seemed aware that this demand was meaningless, so at least it seemed to Princess Mary. I have a letter from him, she replied. He glanced at her with timid surprise. Where is he? He's with the army, father, at Smolensk. He closed his eyes and remained silent a long time. Then, as if in answer to his doubts and to confirm the fact that he now understood and remembered everything, 
He nodded his head and reopened his eyes. Yes, he said, softly and distinctly. Russia has perished. They've destroyed her. And he began to sob. And again, tears flowed from his eyes. Princess Mary could no longer restrain herself and wept while she gazed at his face. Again he closed his eyes. His sobs ceased. He pointed to his eyes. And Tikhon, understanding him, wiped away the tears. Then he again opened his eyes and said something none of them could understand for a long time, till at last Tikhon understood and repeated it. Princess Mary had sought the meaning of his words in the mood in which he had just been speaking. She thought he was speaking of Russia, of Prince Andrew, of herself, of his grandson, or of his own death, and so she could not guess his words. Put on your white dress, I like it, was what he had said. Having understood this, Princess Mary sobbed still louder, and the doctor, taking her arm, led her out to the veranda, soothing her and trying to persuade her to prepare for her journey. When she had left the room, the prince again began speaking about his son, about the war, and about the emperor, angrily twitching his brows and raising his harsh voice. And then he had a second and final stroke. Princess Mary stayed out on the veranda. The day had cleared, it was hot and sunny. She could understand nothing, think of nothing, and feel nothing, except passionate love for her father, love such as she had thought she had never felt till that moment. She ran out sobbing into the garden and as far as the pond, along the avenues of young lime trees Prince Andrew had planted. Yes, I, I, I wish for his death. Yes, I wanted it to end quicker. I wish to be at peace. And what will become of me? What use will peace be when he is no longer here? Princess Mary murmured, pacing the garden with hurried steps and pressing her hands to her bosom, which heaved with convulsive sobs. When she had completed the tour of the garden, which brought her again to the house, she saw Mademoiselle Borian, who had remained at Bogachevaro and did not wish to leave it, coming toward her with a stranger. This was the marshal of the nobility of the district, who had come personally to point out to the princess the necessity for her prompt departure. Princess Mary listened without understanding him. She led him to the house, offered him lunch, and sat down with him. Then, excusing herself, she went to the door of the old prince's room. The doctor came out with an agitated face and said she could not enter. Go away, princess. Go away. Go away. She returned to the garden and sat down on the grass. She did not know how long she had been there, when she was aroused by the sound of a woman's footsteps running along the path. She rose and saw Dunyasha, her maid, who was evidently looking for her, and who stopped suddenly, as if in alarm on seeing her mistress. "'Please come, princess. The prince,' said Dunyasha in a breaking voice. "'Immediately. I'm coming. I'm coming,' replied the princess hurriedly, not giving Dunyasha time to finish what she was saying, and trying to avoid seeing the girl she ran toward the house. "'Princess, it's God's will. You must be prepared for everything,' said the marshal, meeting her at the house door. "'Let me alone. It's not true!' she cried angrily to him. The doctor tried to stop her. She pushed him aside and ran to her father's door. Why are these people with frightened faces stopping me? I don't want any of them. What are they doing here? She thought. She opened the door and the bright daylight in that previously darkened room startled her. In the room were her nurse and other women. They all drew back from the bed, making way for her. He was still lying on the bed as before, but the stern expression of his quiet face made Princess Mary stop short on the threshold. No, he's not dead. It's impossible, she told herself and approached him, and repressing the terror that seized her, she pressed her lips to his cheek. But she stepped back immediately. All the force of the tenderness she had been feeling for him vanished instantly and was replaced by a feeling of horror at what lay there before her. No, he is no more. He is not. But here he, he, he is something, something unfamiliar and hostile, something dreadful, terrifying, and repellent, a mystery. And hiding her face in her hands, Princess Mary sank into the arms of the doctor, who held her up. In the presence of Tikhon and the doctor, the woman washed what had been the prince, tied his head up with a handkerchief that the mouth should not stiffen while open, and with another handkerchief tied together the legs that were already spreading apart. They then dressed him in uniform with his decorations and placed his shriveled little body on a table. Heaven only knows who arranged all this and when, 
but it all got done as if of its own accord. Toward night, candles were burning round his coffin. A pall was spread over it. The floor was strewn with sprays of juniper. A printed ban was tucked in under his shriveled head, and in a corner of the room sat a chanter reading the psalms. Just as horses shy and snort and gather about a dead horse, so the inmates of the house and strangers crowded into the drawing room round the coffin, the marshal, the village elder, peasant women, and all with fixed and frightened eyes, crossing themselves, bowed and kissed the old prince's cold and stiffened hand. And that concludes my reading of chapter 194. Rest in peace, old prince. We'll now proceed to my reflection on that chapter. A Year of War and Peace, Day 194 The Remainder Guilt and remorse disturb even the peace of death. In life, these twin impish spirits linger, welcomed either by the chimera of time, assured that on some soon occasion pardon will be offered, or by a foolish personal pride, asserting the absence of any wrongdoing in the first place. Like some dormant disease, these two nestle into the soul and secretly await the last word. Today, in the Bolkonsky home, they speak. We witness their full power as they effortlessly transform old Prince Bolkonsky from a stern, unforgiving, temperamental Coriolanus into a pitiful, begging, howling leer. Throughout the novel, the old prince has treated his daughter with disdain and unwarranted insult. Whether it be making her feel stupid over her geometry lessons or embarrassed before her suitors, his behavior leaves poor Mary more often in tears than in blissome anticipation of their next meeting. His treatment of her is so bad, in fact, that as he lays dying, the thought can't help but manifest in Mary's brain that her life will be much better without him. She makes plans for a life of happiness without him. Her conscience gets the better of her, though, and despite a lifetime of suffering at his expense, she repents of these thoughts and comforts him in his dying moments. His dying moments, it turns out, are focused upon her. His mind writhes in regret as he thinks back about how poorly he has treated her. He struggles against approaching death, summoning from his failing body and faltering mind the power to beg forgiveness. And recognizing his heirs and his daughter's ever-forgiving and Christian love for him, he offers his thanks to her. We all desire a peaceful and easy death. How often do we prepare for one, though? Do we spend our short time here, like the old Prince Bolkonsky, sowing seeds that yield a harvest of mania and frenzy as death approaches? Or do we cultivate a lovely flower garden for those we leave behind to enjoy? Do we even know how to do that? Daily Meditation Consider thyself to be dead, and to have completed thy life up to the present time, and then live according to nature the remainder which is allowed thee. Marcus Aurelius, Meditations all right, that concludes my reading of and reflection on chapter 194 of War and Peace. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook, A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one time donation at PayPal. The links to all that are down below in the show notes. Tomorrow, we will be reading and reflecting on chapter 195. I hope you join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others. Yeah, big boy? Yeah, Sorry, pop- Dad. What happened? Whoops. What? Sorry. What? What is it? Let me see. It's okay. I, I'm sorry, Dad. I don't want to get in trouble. Dad, I don't want to get in trouble. Hey, Please. Hey, 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 come here, come here. Come don't here. put me in time out. Please. Just relax, baby. It's okay. It's okay. You're making a pun for me? No, I'm not. <laughs> sorry, Dad. That's okay. It's okay. Sorry, broke Dad, for you. Okay, you you were medit. Th- this thing is fragile. It's on. You were you were meditating and you just pulled it too hard. Mm-hmm. Okay, pick that up so we don't. We don't it's okay. What is it? Big boy, I understand. It's okay. Don't worry. I hope I don't get in trouble. You're not in trouble, we're big boy. Let me get another one of those. I mean, when I, we're gonna be a new one, cause so it won't break up. It's okay. These, these these are only things, so you know they can be replaced. Don't worry about it. Um. Who got me a new one that has the break? Here, here. Put out your hands.
Put out your hands because you're going to go throw this away from you. Yeah, but you loved it. I do love it, but it's it's broken. What are we going to do? Cry? All right. I still have to finish reading, so be quiet.